Troy Stocks. I'm the new director of publications here at the Guild. Um, this is my first uh, first time to coordinate and uh, sort of moderate one of these, so um, I hope you'll be gentle with me. Um, we've got a really interesting panel tonight. I'm so excited to, uh, to have everybody here, and uh, we'll, we're also live streaming, so we've got we've got people watching us from I, I have no idea where other places. Uh, probably some place to drive, I would hope. Um, great. Um, before I get started, um, let me just ask you to please um, silence anything that makes noise. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I'm going to just go ahead and bring our panelists in. Um, the creator of Title of Show and Silent the Musical, we have Hunter Bell. Writer of The Divine Sister and Tale of the Allergist Rot Wife, we have Charles Bush. His plays include She Stoops to Comedy and The Argument, David Greenspan. And writer of Yellow Man and Horse Dreams, Pulitzer finalist Dale Orlando Smith. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, get the conversation started. Uh, we're going to chat for about, oh, I don't know, about an hour-ish, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Um, we do have a Twitter audience this evening, too, so we'll be taking some questions via Twitter. Uh, Gosh! I know, it's so fancy. So. <laughs> You, I, I'm curious, I think I, I feel like I know the answer to this, but maybe I don't. Um, did you all start as actors and then find your way to writing, or was it the other way around? Uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, yeah, I went to college and I studied performance, um, and I have a degree in musical theater from Webster University, and uh, that's what I knew about theater. I mean, I'd always kind of written, you know, like as a as a kid and in high school and plays with my brother and <laughs> we would act out in my aunt's basement. But yeah. then I consider that writing. Um, <laughs> they're excellent, excellent shows. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I, I, I came at it as a performer and then kind of crossed onto the other side. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to be an actor. I, was, I, just, I just wanted to be on stage. And then, um, and, I, and I, I always wrote, oh, I always did, but never, didn't really think that, that was going to be what I do. And I just wanted to act. Uh, and really, it was a combination, I think, of going to, I went to Northwestern, and I was a theater major, and I was never cast in a play. And I was just, I was just too weird, you know, and uh, <laughs> never cast in a play. And, and, and I was from New York City, so it made me a little pragmatic. And uh, I thought, if I'm not being cast in a university, in university theater, I may have a hard time in show business. So, uh, and then at the same time, this is in the early mid '70s. There really was kind of a golden age of um, experimental theater, and I began to see more and more experimental theater, uh, and saw Charles Ludlam and Jeff Weiss and uh, uh, from performance group, and, it, and that really opened up a whole world of possibilities of, of creating my own kind of theatrical world. I was trained as an actor both at, at, at uh, the University of California at Irvine, and when I came to New York, I took acting uh, courses at different studios. And uh, so yeah, my, my training was as, as, as an actor. I think, in fact, Charles and I used to come on the same bill once. And you live at the Limbo Lounge? Yeah. Yeah. It's way <laughs> the way of Avenue B and uh, like 10th Street or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were on the... Again, trained as an actor, but also I began to write when I was a teenager, and so I was a teenager, and um, I studied at uh, the American Academy when I was a teenager, I was in high school, and then what had happened was I saw, there was, you know, we'd have to do all these like stupid little things in high school, and uh, I, I uh, saw Short Eyes, which was written by Miguel Pinheiro, and Miguel Pinheiro had uh, the little family, which is what he formed after he did Short Eyes. And you know, Joe Pat, you know, snatched him up, and I became, you know, 
part of the New Eureka scene when I was a teenager, when it was on 6th Street. So, like that, so between there and the American Academy. So that's what happened. I was writing stuff, so. Nice. So I would like to know how you all work. Um, do you, since you're actors, do you start to work on a piece from a character's point of view? Do you, do you imagine a character first? Do you imagine a character for yourself first? Um, or do you begin, say, with a plot, and then sometimes you end up with a role for yourself, sometimes you don't? Just curious how that works, since you've all performed your own work as well. Yeah, I'll start. Um, uh, well, a lot of the work I do, uh, and specifically like the title show, and then another piece I'm working on right now, my collaborators and I, we play ourselves. And so we, you know, a title show is kind of a, to use a Linda Berry word, <laughs> autobiophictionography. So it's taking, like, taking the, the journey of the, the process of creation and, and kind of filtering it through. We didn't work in a documentary. We wanted to do a show, and we actually didn't set out to put ourselves in it. We just, uh, my friends and I were reading it together, you know, as it started, and then we were like, we don't have to see anybody, so we'll just kind of, and as the process, that kind of started with ideas, and then the meta aspect came about of it, and it became more interesting of, we play ourselves, I thought, and we, uh, plus I wanted to do it, you know, we, we were interested in performing, we were trained, and that interests me to do that as well. And then work for myself, I think it just starts kind of with an idea, like with an idea, like what do I want to say, like what's knocking on my door, um, what, what's <coughs> interesting to me, and that's, I mean, that's the reason to do it, I think, kind of because you get to say what you want to say, nobody's telling you, um, unless it's a work for hire job, but usually the work for hire things for me is creating stuff for other people, but when it's work for myself, it kind of starts with an idea of something that I want to say because that's my opportunity to do it. Hmm. Um, well, the plays that I that I write for myself um, tend tend to be a sort of, uh, you know, kind of theatrical film genre parody um, mode or whatever I'm trying to think of it, and um, and so there, there's a certain element of, of fantasy to it. And um, of of me thinking, you know, oh, wouldn't it fun to be to be Barbara Stanwyck in a, a, a pre-code Oriental melodrama? <laughs> wouldn't it be fun to be Mother Superior in a you know a '60s uh, you know religious comedy? Uh, so there's a certain element of, of just fa fantasy fulfillment of what kind of fun role would I like to play, and and, and how fortunate I am that, that I'm in a position that I actually can. And get these things done, and and, um, uh, and so sometimes too, I, I there's certain challenges as an actor that I want to give myself. Um, for instance, I I I, uh, I was in this crazy situation where I actually was had the possibility of, of of writing a movie and getting it a little indie film and getting it done. You know, so it was, it was a wonderful opportunity. And I and I thought I really I so admire the real minimalist film acting where there's almost nothing physically done but it's just through through thought and I really wanted to have that experience so I wrote myself a part and wrote this film that was called a very serious person to give myself that opportunity to really try to do that kind of acting and um, so yeah so it's just all all those elements come into it yeah well it can it just begins with an idea. Sometimes the idea is an expression of some feeling I have or some, I don't know, some projection of myself. Uh, and, uh, and, and the play will take off. I, I always act in my own plays. And um, then sometimes it's just an idea that's not related to myself as a performer. I've just written a play uh, loosely based on the life of, a, of a, an early motion uh, uh, talking film actress, uh, Helen Twelve Trees. And mm -hmm. so that, the idea there was just a little bit of what, what I knew of her life. You know, I've kind of found my way into this play as a performer, uh, not in that role, but... Uh, so you're not going to play Helen Twelve Trees? I'm not going to play <laughs> Helen Twelve Trees. Can I play Helen Twelve Trees? <laughs> 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 and uh, so it, it varies. It, it varies. And uh, I mean, I always, I always, I don't lack ideas. 
uh, I always have something that's that's in my head. And a lot of times they do act a lot of the work. What's important for me is to, um, and it's, it's hard for me, actually it's not hard for me, it's hard for other people to accept, is that, you know, compartmentalization. Um, I write about all kinds of people. And so it's not just a black play or a woman's play or, or, or any of that stuff. It's about writing, like you know, like one of my friends was here, Jack. It's like I'm writing something for him to do, you know. I've written for stuff for him to do. It's it's important, you know. This sounds so corny, but it's it's actually applicable to be a citizen of the world, yeah. And so that's the, the, I, I hear music all the time when I'm writing, you know, like this this new piece, Horse Street. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, Bowie. And. Um, there's some Bowie and there's some Iggy because I'm, I'm a huge I'm a huge rock fan and I love Iggy and the Stooges and all that stuff. So that stuff is in there too. So I, I it's it's a matter of me getting it out quick enough. That's that's what my thing is. Interesting. And Dale, I mean, I know you you've got a, a new piece coming up. It's a solo work. Um, yeah. Uh, and so I'm curious how that came about. Did Black you, did and Blue you, Boys, Broken Men. Yeah, <laughs> did you set out to make that a solo piece for yourself, or did it, it just kind of happen? Black and Blue Boys, Broken Men, that's a co-pro between uh, Berkeley and the Goodman, where I play all men that have been abused. Because we don't think, we don't, we, we don't consider men being abused. You know, so. Um, and, and how, I'm curious, though, how, how did you decide to do that as a solo piece as opposed to writing it as an ensemble piece? Um, I love the, well, androgyny, androgyny, and human stuff, you know? Um, years ago, I worked as a, a counselor with runaway kids, and one thing that you would hear about, or, you, or people didn't want to talk about, was the fact that boys got abused. We're just recently, and, and, and again, the, the stereotype is, well, gay men get abused, da, 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 da. This is, of course, an obvious story. It's like if a boy gets abused, he must be gay, or the person that did it is gay. And this whole thing, this, this, this influx now of women, which has always been, sorry ladies if you get mad at me for saying this, is that uh, when, huh, when uh, an older man seduces a young woman, they say it's molestation. The other way around, it becomes initiation. So that's the reverse sexism. So I just want, just as a person on the planet, I just want to look at that and just look at you know aspects of sexuality and stuff because we all have the androgynous. Again, I think also what we describe as androgynous in and of itself is is sexist. You know, if if, if a man is sensitive, he's a, we say he's in touch with his female side. If a woman is smart, she's in touch with her male side. That's a, that's archaic. So I just wanted to, just in terms of just exploring that kind of stuff. But my question is. What makes you? Yeah. So I, in the creative process, to make something a solo piece or an ensemble piece, since you do both. I wanted to be a woman inside of that maleness, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And also, as someone who is not, I suppose, conventionally female in many ways. You know, um, to also do that. I'm not saying that it's necessarily male, but I'm not conventionally female either. So that's that. It's, it's, it's just interesting. Sometimes you come. You know, I, I've written so I, I do solo work as well, and I do and I write plays for other people. Right. You know, that I act in with other people. And you just kind of in the process, you kind of at, at some point you begin to either explore or determine that this is something you'll do on your own, even mm -hmm. if it's multiple characters. Right. Um, uh, or if it's something that really, uh, really is meant to be played with, with, with other actors. I started out as a, a solo performer. The first, um, really? oh gosh, um, first eight years, six eight, or eight years of my career was a, a solo performer, um, and it, it was just an extraordinary training for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to go back and work on a solo piece again after many many years. But, um, and, and the pieces that I used to do were um, multi-character. I, I love narratives so much that, that they were, um, it was sort of a challenge to try to, to write, the, it, was, it was as if I was doing the whole play, but playing all the parts and not use narration and mm -hmm. just go into, into scene. And you know, I, um, 
at Northwestern, they had a big program called the Interpretation Department, which was uh, working on, on reading aloud prose fiction. And I took certain techniques from that and then developed and made it more theatrical for my for myself. And, and, and it was a fascinating experience. Then eventually, I have to say, uh, there was something kind of marvelous about when I put together this <coughs> ensemble to be able to just play the one part and have the rest of the cast play the parts I didn't want to play. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hunter, I wonder if you'd talk to us a little bit um, about how you think acting informs your writing, your acting background informing that. Right. Well, I think it just gives you a, a, a perspective of like what else has to be done. I mean, I've always, I don't know any other way, so I can't speak about how sure. I only know what I know. And, but I do feel like, like when I write a piece that I'm not in, I feel like I do have an empathy a little bit of like, and I want it, uh, I want, I, I, I definitely have a, a, a point of view and, uh, and, and, and strong opinions about what's done. But I also want an experience, and it's been my experience, that I do want it to be collaborative. You know, I want to, and I'm interested in bringing out the best in what an actor does and what they bring to the table and, and, and writing to that and, and, and lifting that up and like elevating it. If, you know, I, I think about right now, like the, the Silence of the Musicals downtown, there's an actor, Jen Harris, who plays the lead, and Jen's extraordinary. And I'm grateful for her, <laughs> you know, I'm like, so she's amazing. And so it's kind of like, let's get in the pool and play together. And I would be a fool as a writer to be like, say it exactly like this, and I'll hear none of it, you know. And sure. you know, I, I'm I'm interested in that collaboration, you know, and, and with her of her to be like, bring an idea to the table and let's mold that together a little mm -hmm. bit. So, I, and I think I have some empathy or, or about that because that's the experience I would want to have as an actor. You know, I want to, I want people to have a great creative collaborative experience. Um, Sometimes there are times I'm like, <laughs> just say it like this. <laughs> but, the, you know, I do, as an actor, I kind of think about what experience do I want to have, you know, in the room, in the process. And so I think it kind of gives me awareness of that. Of, and also then the day-to-day -day stuff, the, uh, you know, <laughs> what it feels like to wait tables all day long and then have a day of auditions and <coughs> rejection and all those things in your body that is your life experience as an actor. Um, I understand that sometimes that comes into the room, and so hopefully maybe there's some empathy and support for some of that in, in, in terms of the process too. Yeah. I, I think it's helpful, I think probably all of us, that um, it's helpful when, in a way when you're an actor and writing for actors, we know rhythms and, we, and, and you know how to, an, an actor's language, I think we have that in our favor. Um, I, I've had wonderful experiences, of course, writing not only for myself, but for specific people. You know, I've, I've worked closely with um, Julie Halston, I've written 11 parts for her, and, and I know every consonant and vowel sound that sounds funny with her Comac Long Island accent, and, and, I, and, and it's, such, it's so much, and, uh, I just have, derive such pleasure from just hearing her voice in my head, and, and, and then, and then the, of course, when we t get together to work on these things, um, she, since she's not a mind reader, I have to kind of tell her how to do Ju Julie Hoffman every time after <laughs> 25 years. You know, I'll s I, and, and talk better in the third person too. And, uh, no, uh, no, this is how Julie would say it. And then I sort of say the line to her, like, you know, and then she imitates me doing her. And then, you know, so that's kind of we sort of start from there, and then she takes it to another level, but I do that with a number of people. I, lately, I've just been more and more writing for the same, same people, and I, I find it great, great satisfaction and pleasure. Yeah, yeah um, so Hunter, I'm curious, so when you talk about collaboration, um, I mean, immediately I think about title of show and, and how that script came about, um, and I'm since it, it, it feels very much like everyone has their own distinct voice, how collaborative was that process? Well, it definitely, I, I mean, the, we delineated that, you know, that, the hats of like, I oh, take the ownership of writing the book because I was the one like doing the heavy lifting and the one, I'd be the one at night trying to put the greens together. 
And but we would start kind of with a, a scene or something, and I I would work closely with my uh, uh, writing partner Jeff Bowen, who was composer and lyricist, and wherever the scene started, we would kind of create something. Very often, then we would bring it to the table with um, our uh, co-stars and collaborators, uh, two actresses, Susan Blackwell and Heidi Blickenstaff, and we would read it. We would just kind of read it, and then we would talk about it, and then uh, I, you know, I'm open again to say like, sometimes you know, the thing was like, go get a glass of water, and it felt more comfortably like, go get that glass of water, just you know, so it, it felt comfortable in their body. I'm open to that, and again, there are times too though when it, um, we, we tried one time to uh, put a tape recorder in the room. And, and, and tape record ourselves talking about art, and it was a horrible failure because we're all trying to be uh, important and interesting for the sake of the tape, and you know, trying to say, and we, I never even listened, I listened like two seconds, but people were like, it was so full of crap because we're just, I'm gonna say something important for the tape that we'll capture in this play, and it's terrible. And so it was just, again, like kind of with Charles, like I, I they're also my friends, and uh, I know their strengths and talents, so I try to write for them and lift them up, and know what they bring, but in the collaboration thing, it's again kind of stay open and we'd have that work session and I'd go back and tweak it and bring the pages back the next day and talk about it. So yeah, that's a little bit how it worked a little bit. Yeah. Did, it get, did it get dangerous? Because sometimes, you know, I had a piece I was doing out in, in LA called Bones. You guys did okay, it's, it's, it's a heavy duty. It's written like Rashomon, yeah? And uh, the way I wrote it, it's about, it's about incest. Did this woman as well as her, her can't say her husband because he was somebody else, molest their kids. So they meet in this room and you know they and one of the actresses said, Well, this, you know, this this line did so I mean I didn't even know this broad, you know. So <laughs> you know, start jumping up and down, you know. But uh, <coughs> somebody at one point said, Would you consider changing the line? And I said, There's no way on God's good earth that I would do that. So is there, this is what I was asking, so is there a danger sometimes, because if, if I listened to this woman because she was so uncomfortable with the, the, the piece, would you, like, have you ever altered work? Um, with, well, with the title show collaboration, it's a little different because those are kind of my core collaborators that I okay. return to a lot. And so there's, there's a different trust, there's a different communication okay. in, that, in that type of tighter circle. I do know what you're saying sometimes too, it is a little like if you crack the window open, careful, yes. this, then, oh, yeah. and I'm like, well, I was thinking this, and like, so yeah. you do have to be careful about it, I think, sometimes too, about, and, and. And, and actors do to say, uh, yeah, I don't want to interrupt, but no, you know, most actors, they always say, only think about their part, you know, and they're, 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 not, they're not, not, they're, they're not think about, yeah. That's right, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so it can, it, the answer is, can it be dangerous in <coughs> a particular collaboration? Uh, it's not, and there's a lot of communication and therapy to kind of protect that kind of work that we're doing yeah. um, to kind of elevate so all boats rise. But we get into it, yeah, absolutely. But I do think the actual the, the, um, the trend sometimes is oh, that a play is like a screenplay or something where it's just kind of a loose thing that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and actors feel free to, you know, a lot of actors feel free to try to make something sound natural. You know, they'll add in lots of ands and you knows and things. That, and and uh, I, I'm actually teaching an acting class now for the first time. And a lot of the variants are, you know, Captain Hepburn as, as Maria Callas. You know, go over some very <laughs> political big fat <laughs> ideas, you know. And I, oh, what I, I said something very grand the other day. I said, I said, Ev, I said, you must, <laughs> I couldn't believe I said it. I said, you must treat the, the commas and periods the same as if they were a noun and a verb. You know, but but I thought it was uh, true because you know we we spent a lot of time figuring out where that comma went and the new thought begins right. and, and 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 an actor might just say, oh I'm trying to make it sound natural so I'll add Ooh. the the and and the light them together or or change extremely to very not realizing that the first the next line the next actor has says very you know and it's bad playwriting because they only think about their lines. Uh, yeah. I agree with the whole. I mean the, one of the things with Tyler show was very people like it's very conversational it seemed like it was happening off the cuff everything that was said on that play. And, you know, was on that page and was crafted very carefully with a lot of time and insert every and, um, er, you know, comma kind of thing. And I, that's what I wanted, you know, and that's what had been worked on in that because it meant something. So I, I agree with it. But then, then you're like, a play that you perform and are done, I, I even 
directed some of the plays I've been in. And then some, I, I must have met a young German director who told me, it was one of the greatest experiences working <laughs> on your play. I said, well, how did you do it? It was a play of mine called Dead Mother, or Surely Not All in Vain. And it's very specific in the play. The actor disguises his mother is not in drag. So I said, well, how did you do it? He had the wonderful costumes <laughs> and the I said, really? And he cut all the other scenes that we thought were unnecessary. He <laughs> <laughs> did it in a box. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you think work in German? How do you work with a playwright? Oh, we do not like the play. <laughs> we, find, we find it is very disturbing to the work of the artist. Oh. <laughs> That's what he said to me. Oh my God! Yeah, I left this cafe. It was this nice. He told me he wanted to meet me. He loved my work, and I left his appointment just feeling so downhearted. So it isn't just the actors who do this. Some people get a hold of it afterwards. Oh, yeah, sure. oh, yeah. I mean, I've heard someone recently. Yellow Man. They they put uh, they put in four characters opposed to the two kids. That it's a long story where it's you know these two children. And it, turn, it takes away from what it's about. Because, you know, these two people are talking about their impressions of family. And, you know, it's coming from, it's coming from their point of view. And I would heard about this, and I just, like, went ballistic, you know? I mean, and it's, you know, how dare someone do that? You know, how dare someone do that? So it's, and also, it's, and again, we were asking about, like, you know, in terms of work, I, like I said, I hear music all the time. Like with horse dreams, like I would have to be, if, if hopefully someone else, you know, some of you will say this. I'm sorry, I haven't seen that on YouTube. <laughs> um, I'm so, like if I say to somebody, like with this piece, you have to really, again, you have to know rock and roll. And the actor that I'm working with is a wonderful actor named Michael Lawrence. And so Michael was working on one of the speeches, and he goes, I get it, Dale. He goes, it's kind of like, Keith Richards solo and Stray Cat Blues meets something, and I, and I forgot what he said, and I said, that's exactly right. So you can, so even the musicality in terms of that, it, it, it has to be there, or maybe I'm hearing a version, or maybe I'm hearing, it could be so eclectic, so it, you, you, one can't just roll over somebody's work like that, that's horrible. And then I found out he never even got the rights. <laughs> oh, oh my God, he never got out of it. Well, you find out, and then often you find out after the fact, you know. Um, right. I was, I was playing Psycho Beach Party, and it was 90, 90 minutes, no intermission. That was the way it was written, you know, and, and um, it all kind of builds. And, and then um, I, was, I guess some production, I ended up, you know, Googling, you know, it's the middle of the night, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and read some review, and, and I guess they, they, put it in two acts, and, and some local critic said, well, it's clear that Charles Bush doesn't know how to write an act break. He <laughs> doesn't want to kill him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's At the risk of sounding clever, uh, I'm, wondering if, I'm wondering if you could talk about the reverse. How does, um, how does your writing inform your acting, or does it? Well, sometimes for me, it, you know, I'm, I'm consciously or not giving myself a particular challenge. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's something I uh, I want to work on. I mean, uh, sometimes it's a technical thing of, of switching characters very quickly or playing multiple characters. I did a play called The Myopia where I played 17 people in one scene. <laughs> these, all these politicians in the back room. And, um, well, then there's a, a recent play I wrote called Go Back to Where You Are that I acted in. It was, it was more of the emotional trajectory that, uh, I didn't know this at first, but as I began to write it, that became very important to me, that gave me an interesting challenge, one that I had never had before. So, uh, sometimes I think it's just a matter of, it, it, it offers you a challenge to do something that perhaps you haven't done in, in the past. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, um, I mean, because even when I when I do these sort of genre parody plays, there's I come to it from a very emotional place, you know, and, and, and I like I like changing tone and I like being real outrageous and then going for some very very real emotion, and and so it's in a way we, it's how, how marvelous it is for us when we write our own roles to write things we know that that we're another actor has to find the emotional connection. I, you know, there was this scene in the Divine Sister in this, you know, 
uh, Ray, this movie's with play, but where my character uh, fi finds the, the mother that she never knew. And I, I, it's a very, I wrote it because it's a very emotional thing, because you know, my mother died when I was seven. It's a very present search of mothers, a very alive thing in me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I wanted to present myself with that challenge every night of, of having to go to a painful place and use it and f fully. And uh, you know, and the, there were times when it was never, why the hell am I you know, picking up this you know, scab? You know, but, uh, um, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. You know, I, it enriched me as an actor. I think that also too, like it, it I mean, the part I went to the writing when I was attracted to and creating my own stuff because I was more confident in that. When I did other people's stuff, I was a perpetual people pleaser and I was like, am I getting it right? Or somebody did it before, am I going to do it as good? Even if it's Will Parker in Oklahoma, you know, it doesn't matter what. I was like, but I knew if I did my own stuff, I was like, well, it's only, it's right or wrong if I say it's right or wrong. It is what it is, you know, like I made it up, so I'm the judge and. Uh, of, of what that is, and so it made me more confident, I think, and, and so when I return to, and I don't do it much, but if I go to something else that somebody else wrote, I think I'm more confident just in my own skin as a, as a person, as a human being, as uh, a performer, I just all kind of made me more confident moving through the world, and less scared, less afraid. But when, you're, like when you're working with a director and they're guiding your performance, they might ask you for things you're not doing, right? Even in your own work? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And we, I mean, I, I, we, uh, I, I trust very much my uh, our director and collaborator, Michael Bress, is my outside eye, and, and he, I trust him to push me yeah. in places that I, I wouldn't go, or you know, that I'm like, nobody wants to see that, and I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. actually that's exactly what we need to see here, you know, so yeah. I, and, and, and really push the symbols like Charles are like these levels of something outrageous and too, I think, you know, I'm like, let's just make them laugh and, you know, Mike will be like, and now let's make somebody feel something too. So uh, the outside eyes push me to things that I wouldn't normally do in graphic performance. It's funny because I was, I would say, you know, last night, you know, the houses, you know, uh, I was talking to a couple of people about this. You know, Rattlestick is a great theater. You know, they're really great. Uh, but it's, you know, it, but the house has been kind of small for whatever, you know, because they don't have a lot of money to be advertised and stuff. And you know, it, it just is what it is. And last night, two kids were like frat boys. They were like this, they were like. Then this woman walked out. And every insecurity that I ever had <laughs> just came. Because I was telling my friend Jack, because you know what I almost did today? I almost called in sick. Because I was so upset by that. Because I was like, well, what was going through my head is what did I do wrong? And the thing is, maybe I did something right. Yeah. Because it's not supposed to be about people pleasing. You know, it's supposed to be about honesty. And, you know, um, so I think when people, not in droves now, because that, that hasn't happened. But it's like when people walk out or when people kind of look at you sideways or the frat boys are going, you know, you know, uh, maybe, I, you know, I did do something right. Because at this point now, I really, I want to, um, because I, I, I can see myself just primarily, you know, just being a writer. Um, and the stuff that I want to write is really just, I think, off the hook. I mean, I mean that in a very good way. And Horse Dreams is very, very unsafe for me. So I think when something is uncomfortable, if it's uncomfortable for me, then that is good. I'm frightened to displease myself. Mm -hmm. But that, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. You, you never know if you, why people are walking out either, too. You know, you know the man could have colitis if you know, <laughs> right. you, you're shaking personally, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, it just, you just don't know. Your mind you just don't you Look at you know, when we had the Divine Sister, you know, that staged, they, it was a tiny little theater, the Soho Playhouse, and then they added oh. these pews in front. So literally, the, the front row was their knees were against the stage. And we were so, <laughs> you know, and of course, at one point, I had to sit down very grandly, right down here, and somebody, this man's face right here. And as I sat down, you But sometimes you see these people, you know, in the front, they're all lit up in the front, and, and there's this one woman, just the whole play, she was just sitting there like this. 
You know, and everybody in the cast were all thinking, what's going on? Is she insane? What, what is she, you know, well, how could she be so rude? And, you know, I mean, and the assumption, and there was no intermission, so, you know, she was kind of stuck there. And, uh, you know, the assumption was that she hated so much. And then I said, you know, she, poor thing, she might have, you know, had a migraine. Yeah. It might have nothing to do with this at all. Or it might have been she hated the play. Yeah, but, you know, right. you know, it's it's but, you know but, but, you know, don't know. There's yeah. a famous story of Martha Schlama, the, uh, the, she was a you know, cabaret singer, and she, she was giving a performance, and somebody in the front row, one of the tables, kept going like this during her entire performance. <laughs> <laughs> she was so upset, and she went backstage, she said, I gave a, te a terrible performance in front of me. It was great, it was a true, no, it was just, in the front row, and she's talking, and then there's a knock on the door. She opens the door, and that guy is there. He goes, Miss Schlama, you were. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Or, you know, of course, we've all had the experience, too, where it seems like it's such a quiet house, and now people say, oh, I laughed so hard. <laughs> <laughs> One thing is, that I suppose, when you perform your own stuff, too, it's the double whammy of vulnerability, mm -hmm. because, you know, if it's somebody else, you'd be, like, at least the safety net, like, I'm awesome, but this, this writing is terrible, or, yeah. or like, uh, the writing's awesome, but the actor's messing up. When it's you, it's the double exposure. Oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and so it, it, it's all you. It's all you. So I think there is a heightened sensitivity there of, really is. Of, yes. of this or yeah. whatever. Of like, they hate everything about me. Oh, yeah. but there's, also a heightened sense of, uh, there's also a heightened sense of focus because unlike another writer or the director, you don't have to sit there in the audience. That's right. Especially during press uh, press previews, mm -hmm. worrying because you t if, if you're, you're, you're Concentrating on your performance. Oh yeah, I much. I, I do prefer that. Like, yeah. Just being in it, and then you take that ride. Well, you can control your control. 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 It's when you're not in it, and you watch the pacing back. You, or you watch the press performance. And, what are they doing? You know, the cast <laughs> yeah. like, oh, wait, oh no. You guys read yeah. reviews? What? You read everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, not till after. If I'm in it, not till after, because, uh, or, or, or when I feel that safe, you know, like a kind wait, of a wait, safety wait, 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 thing. Wait, 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 but I dipped a toe like a late night self googling, you know, whatever. And mm. it is that thing of like, mm -hmm. don't pick it up, don't put it down, because you know, something like, just whatever thing it just longs on to you. Oh, so, so cool. um, but I just I was reading that uh, I, I think a thing uh, of, of Sinai was talking about a criticism. There was a little, little snippet of that. It was really great too. I thought it was just kind of yeah, eloquent really right. about yeah. about being careful to pick it up. And, and the one thing I love about it too is that the tricky part is it does it gets in your way. It can get in your way. Mm -hmm. And, and get in your way for when you go to sit down at the keyboard or pen, pen to pad and try and to, to try and free that up. So and that's so yeah, that was that's funny because what had happened was uh, I've read some stuff for horse news, and the, the, the reviews have been mixed to good, but there's a few scathing ones, right? That's always going to be. And somebody, and this is the thing that oh man, you know, because I I because I I, I kind of like went kind of. Not quietly, <laughs> and so what happened was someone had said, you know, from the days of her doing solo work, you know, then we haven't we haven't seen her in New York since, uh, uh, how do you call it? Since Yellow Man, I've been working regionally. She didn't live up to her potential. <gasps> oh, oh, oh my! Wow. I went, oh man! Wait, does she know something that you don't know about your future? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. That's a good way to put that, right? So I was like, oh no, you know, then it was like, oh, that was, I mean, all the good stuff went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the bad thing is what I focused on. Of course. But also, of course. again, too, it's like, it's, um, it has to be invention and reinvention. And I'm trying to get to a head. I've said this repeatedly. It's like, you know, not to read all of that stuff, but to a certain degree, as a writer, you do have to read it. As a human, you're going to, you know. Oh, and it, yes. And, and when you that is, that's like, that's I, horrible. if I catch her in the street, And even when you try and avoid, I remember you try and avoid it, you, you can't because it's the real world. Yeah. And so they, if it's good, they'll put it in, in the front. If it's bad, nobody says anything to you, so you Wait. know. That's, I'm just like, hey. Yeah. And so if nobody said anything, I'm like, well, now I know, I know you know, you, yeah. you can figure it out. And then you write, it. and then when you don't read it, so when you hear, you start hearing, you get the sense, oh, somebody wrote this really 
judicious thing. Yeah, somebody says, I'm you, sorry. Well, you know, the review I write in my head is worse than anything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like, John Simon used to always give to me. And, and, oh. and so, you know, finally, I, I, I always have to read the goddamn thing myself. You know, uh, oh, this isn't as bad as I, as, as what I wrote him <laughs> yeah, right. thinking, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I love to write a passage to be panned by John Simon. I was like, no, it is. just getting that clever. Yeah. He's not doing too well. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I guess I'll try not to, not, try not to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, right, right. I know it's streaming. It's streaming. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, it's like the Times Review, because I, I want to you know, know where I stand. I want to know, you know, am I going to be here next week? Am I going to, you know. But I, isn't I, it something I, that we rely on? I mean, it's. Um, <coughs> that the, here we go. There's like I think sometimes certain. This is not saying that American audiences are dumb or anything. Please, and when I say that, but it's amazing how certain works say may die here, but does well abroad. Have you had that experience? Yes. Because I think to a certain degree, not always. Um, people look for justice opposed to truth in a lot of ways, like. Just using this piece as an example, someone had said, "I don't like, I don't like the, the people in this. It's like they're, they're, the parents are not positive role model, and I hate that kind of thinking. You know, I think the role, I mean, our role is to, you know, to tell stories. You know, there's the beginning, the middle, the end, the story, the conflict, the resolution. And if you're looking for that kind of justice, you ha I think an audience has to be open to the fact that there are different kinds of truths." It may not be your individual truth. Doesn't mean that it's not that, that, it's, that it's invalid. And sometimes when something like all this crap that's going on, say when I was reading all of that stuff, it's it's really cool. It, when, I, when I can get you know my, out of my own way, maybe within some of those bad reviews, that there's some truth to it. And I have to you know be able to look at that, you know, and you know look at it clearly. There, there could there could very well be truth. What that is. Some of it is brutal, some of it is <coughs> ugly, and some of it is like, you know, but also what is true? What is, what is possibly true? Yeah. So again, so I sometimes, sometimes I think like with, you know, here in the States, what we tend to do is we want this kind of, we want to end on a certain kind of high all the time. And you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Well, I, I, I actually um, have learned, had certain insights from, from reviews that, you know, after I've calmed down, and, you know, uh, you know, it might be quite a long time afterwards. It could be, it could be just you know a few weeks after the show's over, or it could be a couple years afterwards. And, and um, I've gone back, uh, and I, I find often that the critic senses a problem, but doesn't know how to pinpoint it. And and mm. and then I, after a certain point, maybe from my I can interpret it myself as. Oh, what he thinks is the end of the problem. The end of the play is actually a something more complex than that. Yeah. And 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 often I've done um, actually uh, almost every time um, when I've put together the Samuel French acting edition after the um, New York production is over or, or whatever, I um, I usually do a rewrite on it and, and yeah. for the because of what I've what I've learned from. Doing the play, or you know, having it done. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, I'm wondering, do we have any questions in the audience? Yeah. My question is about hats. Um, is there is there a time in the, in the process, especially when you're in the thick of rehearsal, when you can can switch from writer to actor, or from actor to writer entirely? Do you ever want to? Well, I do know that at some point you have to take the writer hat off. You have to, like, because you have to play the scene, and it's the most difficult thing to do. I'll own that, of especially <laughs> when you're writing if it's other people in it too, because the first few times, you know, I would be across and like two things happen: either like, oh, I gotta, I have to remember to change that, or that's not playing right now. Mm -hmm. So immediately, I'm not in it. So I'm not in it. So I do have to, you know, you have to. <laughs> I got to do the action, set it aside, and be like, I'm in this. It is what it is. When we get into rehearsal or afterwards, we'll have a discussion. But the scene has to play, and we have to live it to its fullest to realize it. Because if I'm half in and half out, I'll never learn anything about it. So I do have a distinction about like, of like, okay, 
respect whatever the page is, try and get out of my head as much as I can, and just play the scene and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I find I take the hat on and off uh, numerous times in, in the rehearsal. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know, it's, a, it's not really an issue for me. I, I, I can get in, into the scene and, and then, or even like in, you know, it's, been, I, it's a wonderful thing being the writer and the, and the, and the actor. Um, in a long run, when we were doing Divine Sister, um, it was way into it. I, there was a line that just was always bugging me, just wasn't worth it. It got a laugh occasionally, but not enough. And I was like, I'm gonna cut that. Yeah. You know, it's so nice to be able to have the authority <laughs> of just a, uh, what they call I, the writer. Yeah, cut them out to let's take that out. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I find it just, I can just throw myself into it and, as the actor and then pull out the second scene. Because yeah. uh, then often when you're in rehearsal, you just do a quick <coughs> rewrite go home, work on it, have it in the next day for the other actors. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, I think it's more, more easy than you would think. Uh, See, it's not easy for me, that's the whole thing. That's because right. it's not, I was, I mean, who, I'm, you know, because uh, actually, like I said, Rattlestick Guys are real cool, but then I also was saying, at one point, can you just, Dale just has to be the actor, you know? Because I was working with Gordon Edelstein, and he knows, he pretty much knows what I want to say. He doesn't write my thing for me, but he'll know. It's excruciating for me, in fact. You know, because I want to get to a point where I have this, okay, let's just get this, because I'll say, let's get this shit out the way now. I don't have to do this anymore, right? I can just act now, right? Dale, he'll say to me, Dale, well, I know you're gonna kick, you're gonna kill me, but we need to, like, can you think about adding? I'm like, oh, God. So it's not, it's not that easy for me. I envy you, it's not, it's not that easy. You know, find it, uh, but finally, we, we kind of go, okay, okay, you know, but it's not that easy. What amuses me is after all these years, I've been doing this for about 35 years, and, and, and I still get where people like, if we're gonna do a reading of a new piece, somebody, the producer, somebody say, or, or, or if I'm working with a new director, um, oh, do you, can, are you think you'll be able to hear the play if you're also reading it? <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it for 35 years. I, I hear it actually better. Oddly enough, mm -hmm. I find myself, I think I almost hear it when I'm acting, doing the reading, and I play my part with all with you. I actually think I, I hear the play better than if I was just sitting there. Huh. I, I I sense oh you know I sense oh the character the acting I'm talking too much like I'm not, um, you know just talking too much or, or the rhythm is off it's it's slowed down I, I I'm somehow you're in the world I hear it better. I agree I agree completely. Yeah I'm like I don't need to swing out and watch. No. <laughs> like, it's a very porous pro process. Can you? So you, you move in and out, it's kind of seamless, I think, at times, and uh, there's no, uh, there's nothing, uh, you know, divided in a way. Do you, you direct your own pieces? I direct, <coughs> I direct my own solo pieces. I'll have someone look at it, but, um, but uh, and I, ha I used to direct my own plays. Lately, I've, I've been collaborating with people. Why? Primarily, we used to open my, no, I just thought, I thought, I, I thought you could do a better job directing it than I could. I think mine was a little static. And well, we just became very fond of each other. We worked with each other on a couple of things. So I gave her the play Go Back to Where You Are, and she did just a beautiful job with it. And, uh, I, I just enjoy working with her. Mm -hmm. Did you direct jail? Did you, <coughs> you direct your own play? I've done it, but I don't have a, a good pair of eyes. I've never done it. Um, because I can allow myself to get away with indulgence. You know, I can, I can milk an audience, but oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. I like the applause I got here, which is very bad. It becomes at the expense, excuse me, because we're in a car, at the expense <laughs> of the, um, the text. So I envy people who can do it, because there was a show that I saw years ago, and this happens a lot, say, within the one person genre. What began to happen was there was a lot of autobiographical work that came out, that came out, that came out. And most people in this room, everybody in this room has an interesting story, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a piece of theater. Because theater is about language, right? And this one person that I'm talking about, I saw the show, solid, hour 15, fantastic. Next thing you know, hour 45, all this, a lot of, you know, interacting with the audience, and it's just, and this person also directed themselves and also worked on this show too long. And it, it relied on audience milking. So I can see where I have the potential to do that. I've done the few times that I've done that, it was about please like me, opposed to 
you know. I've never, I've never directed uh, <coughs> a play, or you know, certainly nothing with me in it. And uh, um, and there are times I think, oh, you know, I wouldn't mind just answering only to myself. But but I, I've always really gotten so much out of the director as, as dramaturg. I, I could deal without the dramaturg as dramaturg, <laughs> but um, but the director as dramaturg, I really really enjoyed all my plays. Have benefited. And that enormously, um, you know, and then the and the questions that a, a, a good director asks you, just the questions that gets you to get you to think, you know, I, I just gained immeasurably from, from all of that. Yeah, I miss that terribly. I, don't, I really would miss it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I write pretty much for myself as well, and I know all of you do, but I belong to. Uh, several playwriting groups over the years, and I can safely say that there's a built-in bias in many of the groups about a writer performing their own work. Uh, they're just dead set against it. They say, even if you wrote it for yourself, <coughs> you cannot do it on your own within this group because you need to be out here to hear it. That's and I wonder, I, I agree with you that sometimes you can hear it better having performed it, not everybody works that way. I wonder how you get around something like this with these groups that refuse to let you do your own work. Is that a different group? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very, their attitude about it. I wrote it for myself and I'm gonna, and if you don't like it, don't do the, the damn play. The do, you need, do you need the group? Well, I experience it in many groups. They just refuse to let the No, but do you, need, do you need to be in a group? I need to be in a group because I appreciate the feedback that I get from the group in terms of the material itself. But I wondered if you've ever experienced any kind of prejudice about you being in your own work. I don't know, I think it's why I was drawn to create my own work because I got to do whatever the hell I wanted to do <laughs> with people. I made it up, I, I mean, I was kind of railing against not, uh, not being able to I wanted to say what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it, and I didn't want anybody to tell me differently. Okay. And so I, I don't know, I, I, I would. The next time somebody says that to you, tell them, this is a great line, I wish I wrote this. Tell them I said, I have the right to invade my own privacy. <laughs> <laughs> the person who wrote that was Anne Sexton. I have the right to invade my own privacy. I think it's so cool. I just have to say too, just that I conceived this play for myself. They're just totally entwined. I can't separate it. And, and this is the way the play is going to be at its best. Is just with me playing this part that I wrote for myself. And I, 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 yeah, I, mean, I just. Yeah. You, well, if you start performing your own work and you and you demonstrate the ability to to bring something great, throw off your own work. Generally, people who want to produce your work want you to be in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you establish yourself as a, as a skilled performer in your own work, mm -hmm. generally speaking, the people you come up to, sometimes you come as a package. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they want you to be in it. You know, yeah. uh, but I, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think groups need any rules, frankly. I, I mean, I, a, a friend of mine is just having a play done that he wrote. He's not acting in it, and they won't let him to rehearsal. And I can't stand it. You know, it's awful. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. And he had no say in the cast. And it's a very, it's a very, you know, small theater, but the mentality is so bizarre. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask, is like, what is it? I mean, I think, I think also in terms of groups, what is it that the individual wants from the group too? Because I also think that we have to. You know, one thing I'm beginning to learn now, for instance, whether it be a director or anything else, but specifically the director, just recently, I began to really know what directors can do with my work. I also think in terms of like when you go to a group or when you go to a school or whatever it is, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you need? I mean, the questions that, I think your, your own individual questions also serve you. Well, anybody who writes anything always relies on uh, uh, 
somewhat astute group of people to give them accurate observations and criticism. Are you sure they're astute? Are the, the people that you're talking to? That's what I'm trying to say to you. I mean, it's the actual studio. Well, I got mixed feelings about that. The point is, <laughs> you, you, expect, you expect a certain standard to be upheld, yeah. okay, because of them. But this is not just about them. Yeah. Almost every group that I come across has that same logic, which is you need not to be in your own stuff. Mm -hmm. You need to listen to it. And if you wrote it and you say, well, I can do it better than somebody else, it's like spend time with it. There's so many groups that won't put, put that uh, put, put that on you. So there, there are many places that won't uh, yeah. inflict that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's just that's limited thinking on their part. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not even it's 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 totally removed from the tradition of of uh, actor performers yeah. of, of actor writers. It has, that, that that's been going on since Festus first pulled up his wagon. I mean, it's just <laughs> well. See, I was in the actor studio very briefly as as, as a writer. Because, you know, as a writer, I think, you're, and I don't know whether they still do this, as a writer, you know, you have a, a limited amount of time. As an actor, you're there for a long period. It's a lifelong thing. And this was back in 88. Frank Cassaro was running it at the time. Um, I brought in some autobiographical stuff, you know, and he was I mean, he was cool with me. And people didn't, you know, uh, people didn't quite know what to do with it back then because this was, this is made. This is like a little bit after Eric. You know, Bogosian was doing. You know, certain. But he he kind of fought back the, the genre where it's gone from there to kind of now. And he was he was you know he was cool. He was he was cool with one of the, the stuff that I brought in. So I don't know whether they're saying that now because it has become such a confessional. Because what's happened with I mean, and I'm sure you guys see this too, where a lot of people are bringing in like a lot of you know actors are out of work and it's hard. And da, 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 da. So a lot of people are bringing in autobiographical work. Not all, and not every not, the one person genre does not have to be necessarily autobiographical, yeah. but it has turned into this confessional to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it's coming. From, having said what I just said, I, I kind of you know whether it's coming from that where people are telling you about their angst, you know, and and stuff because it, I, I see a lot. I mean, I get I teach at HB Studio, right, and um, writing for solo performing, and I get a lot of stuff about. Uh, oh, you know, when I was a kid, I got beaten, or this man did this, or this woman did that. And one of the questions that I ask, I'll ask somebody, I said, now, how old are you? And they'll tell me how old they are. And more than likely, you know, they're from their late 20s on. And I said, if you've lived this long, you've also hurt people. So let's talk about what you've done, too. Or if you're playing your mother, and your mother is a, you know, my mother's a bitch. I said, your mother wasn't always born a bitch. Write, let's write a monologue about her when she was eight years old and frightened. So this is what I'm saying in terms of the kind of work, you know, how how you, how somebody is working with someone. I mean, that that, that plays in the, uh, this kind of victim confessional stuff. I don't know whether that, a lot of that is happening here. Is that is there a lot of that? No, it's not, not <coughs> necessarily solo stuff. It's an ensemble piece. But also with the ensemble stuff, I mean, if it's autobiographical, is it like a lot of it is just like is it angst ridden and? No, I wouldn't say especially. Okay. It's also from the writer's section of the actor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I suspect it's more like what, what, what I was saying. Is they just think, oh, oh, you, you can't have an objective eye because you're on stage and yeah. sort of limited yeah. thinking. Should we, should we, is, but has, it, has it ever been helpful for you to hear someone else do your work? Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. Not part, a writer not a part that one for myself. Yeah, if I know I'm eventually going to do it, <laughs> well, 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 like, um, I do have to figure it out for myself of how it is going to go down. So also, I write, you know, it, 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 it's a sort of interesting thing. I, I um, When I write the roles for myself, I write it so specifically for how I'm going to say the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a lot of times, um, the dialogue I write for myself isn't particularly amusing. You know, it, it's, it's um, and when you read on the page, it seems like movie dialogue. You know, but I know that I'm going to devote certain actresses or, or do what I call my trip on it. And, and so uh, uh, and it was interesting, I saw a production recently, actually, of Divine Sister, with a, a skilled person playing my part, but and, and it got no laughs from the dialogue, and they had to um, bring in all sorts of sight gags to do it because it was written so for my 
particular mm. eccentricities as a performer, and, and the, the lines really weren't that funny. And sometimes when you know money people have seen read the play, they don't think it's all, all that funny. <laughs> but I know that it's that, that this going I'm gonna get laugh here, laugh here, laugh yeah. there based on my observations of star acting or, or a actresses. And so it's it's sort of, it's, it's so specifically written for me. Yeah. You, know? you see, when I I I uh, I've acted in a in a Charles Ludlum's The Mystery of Rumor Bell, and I had seen Charles Ludlum do it. I think I saw him twice. But before I went to do it. I went and got the video. I went to the library to look at how he did it because I, I thought, well, I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to see what he's done, but what I can learn from it. And in fact, I've done that with a couple of other plays, mm -hmm. uh, not written by the actor that first played it, but uh, with both the boys in the band and also in the revival of the Royal Family. I wanted to see what the other actors had done. But certainly in the case of somebody who performed in their own play, uh, and certainly in the case of Roman Beth, I thought. I've done that too. I tell YouTube is just the most marvelous thing. Oh, yeah. I recently, uh, I had to do Lady Bracknell and the performance of being earnest for LA Theater Works. It's this thing where they do it on the radio in front of a live audience and you only get two rehearsals and then you do it, you know, and, and so I thought, well, I, I went on, I, I, I knew the play and I'd seen the movie, seen Edith had this movie, but I went back on YouTube and I watched Wendy Hiller doing it. I watched uh, Joan Flyright doing it. I saw, you know, Edith Evans and just took, 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 you know, uh, uh, yeah, to see. I remember one time a friend of mine was auditioning for um, um, part of Tessie Tora, Gypsy, in one of the Gypsy revivals, and she uh, she said, "I don't understand. They, they, they she's supposed to be kind of you know she's a cheap stripper, but she's so you know sort of hoity-toity. I don't get it." And I said, well, why don't, "For the audition, why don't you watch the movie and just see where the laughs are?" You know. Oh no, I couldn't do that. Well, you know, it's there. You know. Yeah. You know, take it for the, get the part. I, I'm just having a very weird experience because I saw your play. I didn't know it was your play. I got to the theater late. I always pour over the, you know. And after the theater, we just went for coffee and talked about the play. What, well, Orange Dreams? Yeah, so it's so interesting to think that you were the writer. I've never had this happen before. And, I, and I, the character is so serious and so much the conscience. And it's very, it, it makes sense. It really makes sense. And it would, it would be interesting, I think, to see someone else play it. Would they bring, obviously they would, but it's. No, it's cool if someone would play it. I'm not writing it. I didn't write that specifically. No, just I know that, but yeah. it's just really not knowing. Usually I've seen that, even though I know the right. And it's just, it's, 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 as an audience person, it's just really interesting to get that now. Someone in, like, there's, a, there's someone called David Kale. David Kale is a wonderful soul. He wrote a piece called Lillian. 
And I know that there's a, years ago, he told me that there's, there's an actress, performance artist, comedian called Penny Arcade that seemed mm -hmm. like he wanted to play with me. And I said no, and he said no too. Because that changes the dynamic. It totally changes what it's about. Yeah. I, I like seeing, that I guess there is, for lack of, you know, again, there's the androgynous. Androgynous, you know, and underneath, the, I don't know who wrote this, but they said, you know, underneath great writing and acting, there is androgynous. So that would totally, I don't, I'm not, I'm having, me having said that, I'm not saying that, you know, what I'm doing is great, but I like exploring that aspect, those different aspects of things, and whatever my version of what is masculine or what I thought is masculine or what I thought is male, you know, is, is I, I want, I'm taking it from that, from that point of view. It was the same thing when he does, when, you know, when, when he does drag, you know. I don't even think of him as being drag trafficked. When I'm watching Charles, I'm seeing a woman. I mean, would it change? It totally would change it. It totally would. Yeah. I know, I, it's, uh, you know, when I, I mean, in my plays, when I, when I who I choose to be in drag or, or not, it's very, you know, I, uh, I mean, somebody does a play in Tuscaloosa, they can do whatever the hell they want to do in it. But, um, but when we do it in New York, and it's my production, it's very specific. I, there, it's, Certain roles, it was very interesting when you, uh, I like taking the, the not the obvious, like when we did Psycho Beach Party, there was part of the mother that was a very sort of Joan Crawford kind of thing, and it was very much sort of the drag queen part. But I, I wrote it for this wonderful actress, McGann Robinson, who, who had a, a, somehow, there was a slightly androgynous thing about her, which she had this magnificent low voice, and, and she kind of, a lot of people thought she was a guy in drag, but then there was this wonderful moment in the play where there was a little flashback where you saw the mother when she was young, and it, and, and and we had her costumed in this rather tight dress. You just saw McGann's figure and, her, and, and and how womanly she was, and and this very soft wig. And so we saw that there, that there was this underneath sort of this dragon lady, sort of drag queen. There was this girl, this vulnerable girl, and it was a marvelous moment. And um, so I um, and I think when that play is done, usually they. We've got somebody in drag playing it, but I thought it was very interesting when we did it that way, or just to do the opposite thing. No, I was like in my plays you now. You know, the Julie Halston sort of plays the drag queen part. Really, in my in my show, she's the, the really outrageous one, and I'm sort of the, the kind of the elegant lady next to her, being the really outrageous person. And I, I think it's kind of interesting to not, you know, and, and most of the ladies I work with are about five, eight, you know, and mm -hmm. so we're, oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I have a question to just the writer part of oh, the guys um, and maybe. Um, I'm interested in um, how you feel about um, stage direction, adding it, taking it away, and Charles, you mentioned what you do sometimes before you publish. Um, you mean the stage direction? Yeah, like keeping them in, cutting them out, what you learn from certain things and how that determines I'm sorry, what you learn from production and what, how that determines whether you keep it in. And when you send it out into the world like Yellow Man, Dale, like, do you feel compelled to, I don't know, stamp it? In, that's not really the right word, but like stamp it in any way? When I write it, I, when, when it comes out, I, you know what happens is, depends on what it is, yeah? And, I, and, and I'm, like I said, with, with the exception of two times, I've worked with, the majority of directors I've worked with are, are, are smart. I can be, uh, no, except for, yeah, except for twice, they were dumb. <laughs> but uh, I, some, this, is, this, is, uh, this is where, in terms of trusting a director, happens for me. And also not getting too precious with what's in my head. Because what's directly, directly in my head, I have to have a healthy sense of balance, boundary. Is this, can this realistically happen from the page to the stage? So sometimes I, it'll, it'll just come out, it'll just come out, it'll come out, and it's like when we're, when we're on our feet doing this, you know what, this does not work. So, but yet, but initially I do put it on, on, on the page, yes. But sometimes when we're actually getting up and we're moving and we're doing it, I, I've learned not to be so precious with it, but yes. So I'm giving you a mixed message. On the one hand, it has to be there, on the other hand, when, if it has to go, it has to go. Yeah. I, 
have like very few um, stage directions in the plays. There, I have almost nothing except for the exit, enter, enter, exit, uh, and then unless it's just a, a real plot thing. Um, and then, of course, when you publish it, you know, then, you know, of course, in the it's a tricky thing, because when, when you've actually had the production, there are more things you want to put in. But you know, have to watch out, too, because it's not fair to the director. You don't want to, you know, put in things that are his, you know, that he brought in, that, you know, for his production. Um, you know, we used to, in the, uh, uh, in the Samuel French, or in the acting edition, you have the full costume plot and, and, and all of that, and, you know, which is very helpful to amateur groups. Um, but it's in, in my earlier scripts, boy, we, it really wasn't fair to the uh, costume designers. We, you know, bottle green velvet dress with, you know, <laughs> a, you know gold, gold lace trim. You know, it, it, it was so specific, so you know, it's not do that anymore. But yeah, you have to be kind of the fine, fine line. But I, I, uh, I tend to have very, very, very little, so it's just as necessary, it's just that it's clear. Mm -hmm. It was necessary, and, and as Elizabeth was saying, in the course of, of rehearsal and and, uh, and production, you might take something out. You might add a little something. You know, um, like it was like a line, something you might just change it. And then, uh, and then when you say people are going to do what they're going to do, and that's part of the game. And I'm part of me is grateful that it's being done as a writer, mm -hmm. and then part of me is like, oh God, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, I so learning to put less and less, and and that that production is going to do what they're going to do with it, and a good time will be had by and all. A good time will be had by all, and the same thing too with experiences where we've flown out and seen things and worked with people, and it still didn't matter, and that's fine. I mean, it's it's not what I envisioned or intended, but it's what's happening. So I wonder if you ever cut stage directions out for the other actors. But then the director gets the one that you had originally. Well, there were like no, you know, I put those notes in the front. They asked us to write everything too. But again, I think like I don't know. Uh, in my experience, when I'm talking to directors and things, you can say what you're going to say, but they come out and sometimes they'll respond and maybe do something, and a lot of times they'll just do their own thing. And mm -hmm. that's not. That's, I think that's not unique to those of us who perform in our own plays. It's true for any play, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, but I was just thinking about the other day, uh, we were having a conversation because <coughs> then you'll have a playwright like Samuel Beckett who is so specific in his plays and frankly when it's ignored or when there's a, a perverse reading of it, it's so disrespectful, to, especially to a, to a playwright like that where he's been so specific for a, for a very good reason. So it really varies, it, it depends on the writer, it depends on the kind of play they're writing. And some things can be more open, and some things really it was lifted actually from uh, if for those who don't know the piece it was it chronicled its own creation from like inception to the opening on Broadway and the form for the original uh, theater festival that we submitted it to had a field and said like name, address, genre, yeah. title of show. Um, I think it actually said like name of show or whatever, but I didn't like name of show, so the title of show, and it was in brackets. And I liked it. I liked it part, not part, not out of gimmick, but what I liked it the most about it was that I liked it people did not know what they were coming to experience. And you could mm -hmm. just, there was something, it sounds kind of, I don't want to throw up in my mouth a little bit when I talk about it out loud, but I feel it, of, of like you projected whatever experience you had walking into it. You know, it wasn't called making a dream or writing a show or whatever, you know, like I didn't want it, I kind of wanted you as an audience to walk in with a blank slate and sit down and have an experience. And so it was insert insert your experience here was kind of what what the idea <coughs> behind it was you know so it was part of the gimmick of the thing of course but it really it stuck because I wanted you to have a blank slate as an audience and walk in and whatever you felt about it is it funny I don't know is it sad is it tongue in cheek is mm -hmm. it campy is it, uh, whatever you I wasn't telling you what to feel about it you just walked in and sat down and had an experience that's what interested me about it curious to speak to Hannah what does that mean. Out 
probably is. That's what the beef was? Yeah. All that eloquence? Yeah, really uh, <laughs> is that our the streaming the radio for you? This has nothing to do with the streaming. It's uh, just fine. We're still streaming. Still streaming. Uh, okay. <laughs> but that was the origin of that. Yeah. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, um, so picking up on that, where you didn't want your audience to walk in with a preconceived notion or feeling like they knew what you wanted them to think already. Um, a lot of writers I talk to are not in favor of writing with a political purpose or with the purpose of, um, I don't know, intentionally to shape people's thoughts and stuff like that. You know, did you just write for the experience of the But when I write, I very much have that purpose. Um, it's, one, it's like a driving behind me writing at all. So I want to ask you guys, um, how much of that shapes your writing versus just, you know, you just write what comes to you or what's entertaining to you versus wanting to actually influence uh, people's thoughts or connect with people? But when you read stuff like, say, All My Sons, or when you read August Wilson's stuff, it's there. But I think when somebody gets so into bombarding people with a sense of right, a sense of wrong. Again, theater is, it's about the story. I, I will get the political stuff and what someone feels and thinks within the storyteller. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I don't mind being taken there. I just don't want to be preached to. Because a lot of it becomes preaching. And I really don't like things like positive role models and stuff. I really don't like it. Because what ends up happens, happening is because that, that's where it becomes preaching and formulaic, you know? Um, again, you know, going back to war streams, the whole point of that is, is like, you know, again, when I, it's really, people are talking, I mean, race is mentioned, but ultimately it's really, if, if one were to see it, you'll see it's about the break, uh, how a child has to give birth to himself, you know, and how there are people on the planet who should not have kids, and we're looking at the generations, you know, the sins of the father and the sins of the mother, right? But it's done hopefully with good storytelling opposed to someone just, doing this and doing that and, you know, you're trying to invoke and provoke without imagination or without the beauty of language. Mm -hmm. So when someone deliberately becomes like, you know, and I see some, I, there's wonderful performance art, but you've also got people who get up and rant and rave and I just don't want to hear it. You know, it's not, I, I, I'm, you know, what's happened today, for instance, it's like, you know, it's good that the vagina monologues are, is, is in the world, but a lot of it really just got taken off the hook because it no longer became about theater. It became a political movement in and of itself. You know, I mean, I, I was I was asked to do it. I didn't, you know, I, I, you know, <coughs> I didn't have the time. And, and me personally, I think it's a necessary piece, but it didn't necessarily interest me, you know, individually. It doesn't mean that it's not valid, but. At one point, you know, it was done, in, I think it was done in, um, my friend Kathy Chalfant was in it. And this was done at my Madison Square Garden. And someone else was there and said, there was a, a flyer on the, on the uh, chair. If you're a woman and you've been raped and we mentioned that, raise your hand. That's no longer about theater. That's not theater. So that stuff kind of turns me. I think I, I have a, I mean, I do have an agenda, I want you know, ideas. I mean, I'm interested in sharing my ideas out to the world. But I, I tend to agree, I want a good story. I characters. I, I want characters. I want human, to human experience. Yeah, but it's, because if it's just, I don't know if it just comes from a singular place of political or ideology, or so I don't know, I don't, I'm like, I don't know how, how that expands over a whole story. There's a tradition, yeah. I mean, there is a tradition of the, um, impassioned um, sort of treated play, but but I, I think when it really works, like I, I love the normal heart. And I thought, you know, and, and, and I remember when I saw it, the original production, I I never had that experience as an audience member of seeing really seeing the world that I was living in at that moment on stage, and and it was it was extraordinary feeling. And then it was interesting seeing it again recently, uh, where the world has sh shifted a bit as far as AIDS goes shifted, um, and, and it was interesting seeing the play slightly divorced from its just polemic, and, and I thought it worked awfully well, and, you know, um, but as, as much as Larry Kramer's, you know, rage, is, and, and there are characters who are just his mouthpieces at times, still there was essential characters and a, and a human drama that was so compelling, and, and 
that was grabbing us as opposed to just, you know, and lecturing at us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I vote for you and Rollins. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that and, and uh, but but that <coughs> that can incorporate a variety of different approaches. Yeah. Uh, and and they're even uh, I'll even set up for for plays that are not really even concerned with story. I I, I was studying the work of Richard Stein for some time, and she she says explicitly she's not interested in story and action. In an emotion of time. I think there's still a human experience yes, there, yes, but yes, it's yes. it could be narrative. And I've worked for and I've worked for Richard Foreman too, which you know is huge narrative, you know, violently at times. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's still it, it's still uh, is an expression of, of, of human experience. So I think that can take many forms, and it can be a strong political. Mm -hmm. um, it can be very stylized too. It doesn't have to be naturalistic. Mm -hmm. People. Political I mean, Arthur, we took, you know, you think about Arthur Miller and those, uh, and uh, the Crucible, the Crucible, I mean, you know, which was a reaction, which is, as he said, uh, stated, but the human drama of it is just uh, so overwhelming, even divorced from that particular situation. Uh, if one is not as attentive to that particular period of American history, then one can still easily be affected by that. We have time for one more quick question if anybody has anything. No? Great. I tell you what, yeah, go ahead. Uh, an analysis yeah. of the panel. When you're writing your story and you hit a wall and you get stuck, what do you do? <laughs> so I'll, I'll take a break. <laughs> I'll, I'll just take a break to, to try not to struggle with it and go take a walk or watch some bad television or some good television or uh, sometimes I, I, I try and push through it, you know, so if, if I know, I don't know, I try and have an instinct to be like, am I, am I just filling the tab because I'm lazy or, or I don't want to, or I don't feel like going here um, and that way I push through. But then sometimes it's okay to be like, I'm going to put this pen down yeah. and I'm going to go out to the world and see, <coughs> and you never know what might inspire me, you know? Yeah. And, and so to release the struggle a little bit, to surrender to it as opposed to like, the show's not coming. If it's not coming, it's not Wait coming. Wait it out. Yeah. It might be a week that goes by. You <laughs> just can't try and try and just right. can't force it. Yeah, I don't know what three okay words. Oh, I, I love that. What? 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 She said, I don't know or three okay words, and I agree. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, I'm talking big and bad, because a lot of times I, it, it pisses me off when I don't know. But it, uh, yeah, I've learned that I don't know Wait, it's just frustrating for like, you know, just want to get, get that first draft out oh, with yeah. and it's stuck. And, and the double arrow would be like, so you're frustrated it's not coming, and then the double the arrow would say, you punish yourself again that you're mad that it's not coming to yeah. you. So that's the that's to kind of break that cycle a little bit. But yeah, not be gentle to yourself and all those I guess, you know, there's all that time we spend lying down, I guess it, so it's a little productive too. You, you know, the ideas, your brain doesn't mm -hmm. stop. Yeah. But it's, it's hard. It is hard. How do you write? Do you write usually this or the story of yeah. Do we write? Yeah. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. Never stop. I never stop. Never stop. Yeah, yes. uh, uh, yeah I, I always fantasize that, like, I just like I'll sit down and write and it'll come spool out like gold and it'll rock the world and I'll be done and hand it into the world. It doesn't work like that at all. So it's a little just kind of living in the awesome chaos of it. And it doesn't stop. It does, I, I, yeah. I've heard with Dega, but it could be because my uncle said a, a work of art is never finished, it's abandoned. Oh, well, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, yeah, but I think you have to really. To, I mean, I, I really enjoy um, the e editing and, and rewriting. I, I that, that first trying to get through a first draft, I find it so agonizing at times. Um, but uh, once I have anything on paper, then I, it's not a discipline, I just love, I, it's an escape, I just want to get back in over and over and, and, and cut, cut one more word, find that one more funny thing that amuses me to put in, um, reshape, I, I, you know, I, I love it, I just love it. Would you guys help me thank them for coming to us?